So this is my first time at a Google Hangout. And so I'm not sure exactly how this is supposed to work. So until uh, I get a call back from, from someone to see if, if possibly we could uh, have other participants call, maybe I'll just uh, start with a little summary of, of what exactly uh, Wild Planet uh, is and how it started, give a little background. Uh, I've been in the seafood business for 25 years, and in that time, I recognized over the first, say, 10, uh, 12 years that, that there's some serious problems in the fishing community, uh, not the community of people, but in, in the way the, earth, uh, the, the Earth's ocean resources are being harvested. And that is, um, is something that I wanted to address, uh, being a person with an environmental background myself. I realized that I had the opportunity to be an industry insider and reach out to the environmental community and make an attempt to, to find a way to harvest the oceans more sustainably. So in 2001, I, I made the change at our company to use only uh, seafood items that are uh, harvested from sustainably uh, well, caught and well-managed fisheries. That was um, at a time when we used to call that eco-friendly seafood. The word, the word sustainable wasn't even in uh, use at the time. And then sustainability became, of course, a very big deal thereafter. In 2004, we began the, the distinct brand name and company Wild Planet as a shelf stable seafood company that would uh, that would produce primarily tuna to start and then we've advanced of course to many other items but it would it would produce tuna from sustainably sourced fisheries and tuna specifically is a, is a, a very uh, big item maybe the most consumed canned item in the in the world the canned seafood item we began by using only the pull and line and the troll caught tuna in the, off the west coast of the United States. And since then, we've expanded to buy from uh, various pull and line fisheries around the world that practice the absolute best uh, practice of sustainable sourcing. People uh, ask me uh, a lot, well, how do you know that pull and line fishing is really better than other kinds of fishing? And that all has to do with, with selectivity. Here's a little story that uh, I'm from the Northern California coast where in the old days when my grandfather was, was uh, had just immigrated here from, from Portugal, they used to, to fish in the rivers for salmon with dynamite. Well, that's a pretty effective way to get everything living in the river up to the surface floating for collection and, and uh, to bring that uh, bring that home for use but dynamite is not very selective it kills everything that's there well pole and line fishing catches just tuna uh, you, you're only catching tuna of the right size and you're catching tuna that is uh, that is this the species you're actually targeting. You're not catching any other uh, thing, really. Uh, maybe some very fraction of the fish might be a, a yellowtail. Uh, but those, those fish that are coming aboard the boat are, are actually your target fisheries. In, in the um, other fisheries for tuna, they're catching a lot of different things. Um, and that is a real problem because bycatch mortality is the very thing that is, that is really decimating the biodiversity of, uh, of, of the oceans. The first question that's being asked here is how did wild planet become a sustainable seafood company? We decided to, to look for, for, someone that produced unbiased uh, scientific advice and that advice we found uh, to be very trustworthy at the Monterey Bay 
aquarium seafood watch program. They don't have any particular agenda of, of, uh, of what they want to accomplish except to promote consumer and uh, retail uh, education on sustainable fishing. So in 2004, we, we used that uh, resource to actually begin vetting all of our products as to whether they were green, yellow, or red. Of course, we don't have any red products at all in our lineup. We, we got rid of anything that, that may have been uh, a product to avoid. Wild Planet um, uses that resource, and that resource is, is uh, what really guides us in, in how to distinguish what a sustainable seafood product is. Sustainability can be uh, measured in a, in a few different ways. The way they produce their full reports at Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is they look at the biomass of the fish. Is the fish really a healthy stock fish? Uh, is, it, is it either uh, fully exploited or is it less than fully exploited? If it's overexploited, that that product really should not be promoted as a sustainable item, but there should be reductions in effort uh, so that that product will come into uh, a standing of being within its maximum sustained yield. The second thing is that the fishing method should not be destructive at all to any of, uh, of the habitat that may uh, be a, a critical habitat for the reproductivity of the species. For example, bottom trawling can really mess with uh, the rookeries that, that many of the species depend upon for, for, the, for the upbringing of the small fish. Now, in the case of tuna, wide open sea, there's really no damage to, to the habitat. But the big thing that uh, people wonder is, uh, what is the, the, the impact of your non-target species? And I just spend just, just some time on that. The, that's what's called uh, a consideration for the bycatch. You're going out to catch tuna, and what else might you catch? Well, as I was explaining earlier, in the case of, of tuna, uh, pulling line fishing for it is just catching tuna. It's catching only tuna, and it's catching tuna of the right size. Other fisheries, like long line fisheries, will, will deploy a, a horizontal line, many miles long, sometimes 50 miles long, of baited hooks. You have a hook with a sardine or a, or a mackerel, and that is submerged maybe 50, 90 meters below the surface. And, and on each end is a, are large buoys, and that weighted line is, is, is below the surface there. And whatever comes and bites on that is going to get hooked. And if it's a turtle, for example, that, that bites on a sardine as it's foraging, wants to go to the surface, that sardine or that turtle cannot make it back to to the surface to breathe and of course dies. Sharks as well get caught on those. Uh, they need to keep swimming to oxygenate their gills. That's a problem for sharks. There's about a 20 to 30% bycatch of other species that uh, longline fishery is responsible for. And that bycatch ends up really just being discarded overboard. And, uh, and that's a, a, a wantonly wasteful uh, catch method. And so, uh, the pull line fishing is is really an answer to that because it doesn't harm anything else. It's only taking what's being used. Another method that is very egregious in the way of bycatch is is the purse chain fishing method. Now, in the old days, they used to use uh, binoculars to spot a school of fish, or they they would employ helicopters to spot a school of, of tuna. The boats got big enough where they took a helicopter aboard the top of the helicopter or the, the you know, top of the boat and they went out and they spotted schools and they would wrap an entire school with their purse say net, pull the pull that bottom of the purse together and then crowd the fish over to the boat and take them aboard the boat. That catches mainly free swimming tuna that all 
typically swim in a, in a particular age class. Uh, a 10 to 20 pound age class will all swim together. The, the really small ones are off in some other place. And that was, uh, that, that was actually pretty good. Uh, a very small amount of bycatch, but then the FAD device was developed and that's a fish aggregating device. It's a floating device that, that attracts everything within a very large radius of that device because the small fish come there for, for, um, for a sense of protection because it, it appears to be some floating thing that they can get, get, get habitat protection from. And then the small fish come, the larger fish come, and everything aggregates there. And that's really what's happening now with tuna fishing is that most of the tuna in the world is caught with these fish aggregating devices that, that aggregate everything living whether it's tuna or whether it's some other species, it comes together in these aggregations of, of biomass and the fishermen come with the same per se net, wrap them, bring them aboard, but 20, 30% of that catch is either non-tuna or maybe it's these tiny baby tunas that literally are a pound, two pounds, that should be 50 pounds. And that's preventing the, the yield uh, of the living animals, that the animals should not be targeted at one pound. If you're going to take the life of those of those tuna, it should be at a yield that really makes that makes justification for the harvest of that fish. Some uh, one of the questions that's being asked here is uh, the recent Greenpeace ranking of the tuna brands. There were 14 brands that the American Greenpeace ranked. And those 14 brands um, were ranked either green, yellow, or red, and most of them fell into the red category. Uh, the question is, what are the findings for the failing companies? So what makes a company fail a, a Greenpeace ranking? There is the sourcing of the fish. Is it sourced from fisheries that that are uh, free of bycatch that are that are from from uh, abundant stock fisheries and free of the habitat depletion that's a big ranking most tuna on the shelves in, in the united states is from either long line or pole or the um the per sane fad caught fish that's most of the of the product on the shelves and that will certainly cause the failing in a, a failing mark from Greenpeace. In addition, uh, lack of transparency and a policy that doesn't really track exactly where the fish comes from will also cause a ranking failure. Uh, sometimes there's a lot of ambiguity in, in, in where the fish was actually caught because some of these boats uh, go on uh, go out in international waters and they're catching tuna and some boats are actually trans shipment boats where they go and they meet other tuna boats and they aggregate from various boats different catches and then bring them back because it's there's just quite some distance to come back to a cannery and and the mingling of all that fish is also something that will cause a a green piece uh, failure in in, in in their rankings. We're happy that, that Greenpeace saw that Wild Planet was the number one ranked company for uh, sustainable seafood sourcing. There's another question. Uh, why is there a need for sustainability? And uh, how do non-sustainable practices affect our oceans? The need for sustainability is that uh, if if this planet is going to continue to to produce food for billions of people that live here. Of, of course, the oceans need to be productive. It's Wild Planet's belief uh, that, that the wild ocean atmosphere is really the most productive pond that could possibly be. If we stand back and allow the oceans to be wild, they will reproduce. If we take from that selectively, and wisely, if we allow every living thing to grow and to yield a good amount of, of food for every, uh, every fish that we take, 
those oceans will yield billions of pounds more uh, tuna uh, and other products than they would yield if the products, the animals are caught prematurely. Non-sustainable practices are disrupting the, the actual diversity of, uh, of the biosphere. Uh, the ocean atmosphere has a mix of species. And, and if many of those species are simply put back over the edge of the boat dead and drift to the bottom, that the depletion of those species, uh, even though they may not be commercially important species for consumption, they are important species for biodiversity. Question number five, what can consumers do to ensure that seafood that they are eating is caught sustainably? Well, that's a, that's a very challenging thing because uh, that, that requires a consumer to really be knowledgeable and educated. We aim to assist folks to, to educate and uh, uh, to, to really understand the issues. Uh, what consumers can do uh, is look for specific catch methods on the products that they're buying. Now, I, I'm speaking primarily from the point of view of, of the shelf stable category in, in the seafood aisle. Uh, now, if you're eating at a restaurant, uh, if you're buying from a retailer, that becomes a lot more difficult because how do you know exactly at a restaurant uh, if, if your restaurant, if your restaurant tour has sea bass on the menu, what, what is sea bass? It's so many things. So um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has, has really done a lot of good work in that way. And they have educated folks uh, uh, with the, the, the consumer cards that they can use to, to, to find the different species that, that are best choices for sustainability. And having that card with you when you dine makes you impossible to dine with. Uh, actually, it, 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 will, it will help you and it will put pressure on the, on the restaurateur to look into that matter and to know that people are coming to the restaurant and, and they're, con they're concerned and they want to know. And that restaurateur may, may be able to, uh, to ask their vendor and be assured from their vendor exactly where their fish is coming from. But in the retail uh, grocery department, you can look at, at, a, at a canned tuna product, for example, and if it doesn't say the particular catch method that was used for that fish, it's probably a method that they're not proud of because it's not included on their packaging. And so only buying products that, that say pole and line caught, or you can buy products that have uh, a, a third party eco logo like MSC, Marine Stewardship Council, or Friend of the Sea is another one. Those are, are um, uh, NGOs that that actually rank certain specific fisheries. Uh, we don't use that uh, logo on our fish because it, at this point, they don't uh, certify enough fisheries uh, to make, to make the, the, the scale of our sales uh, meaningful. So we stick with the, the recommendation by Monterey Bay Aquarium that pole and line fishing is the best tuna method for, uh, uh, of all and, and nothing else is in our can but that kind of fish. Here's a question. How can consumers encourage the big three seafood companies to switch to sustainable fishing methods and be transparent about how and where they're catching their fish? Well, I suppose uh, the best way to get the attention of the big three seafood companies is to stop buying their products because that's what speaks to, to big business. If their products are not uh, moving off the shelves and they have a, a reduction of their sales that's attributable to their sourcing policies, they will have the best motivation to do something about it and to, and, and to change how they source. So that would be my recommendation. Um, the big three companies know exactly uh, 
what kind of fish they should be sourcing. But it's not financially advantageous for the big companies to switch from the fad per se method because it's so effective at, at aggregating fish to your catching spot. And it's a, it, it makes for a cheaper product, less expensive product than they can, and, and they can thus compete on shelf with the other brands. And, and that's been sort of the, the, the MO of the big brands is it's all about fighting for shelf space. Um, it's, it would be very nice if we were fighting for ocean health. There's a question about mercury in seafood and in mercury testing. Of course, the oceans have mercury uh, dissolved in them. That's been the case since since the since the the volcanoes that erupt and put and put ash into the, into the atmosphere uh, and, and it dissolves in the water and it becomes part of all living things. That's just a naturally occurring thing. We have addressed the issue of mercury in seafood and we pioneered uh, a low mercury sea uh, tuna item since 2001. It was curious to me back then, uh, why is salmon so low in mercury and tuna that lives in the same ocean, eats the same things, is not. Uh, so that was something that uh, that I was concerned about. Uh, I determined that, well, here's the answer. Salmon live two or three years at sea and then die. And tuna continued living for 12 or 15 years. So if I could find a tuna that was only three years old, like a salmon, it should be also low in mercury. So what we've done is we only use pole and line caught fish. And those uh, pull and line fish are much younger. Uh, they're only nine to, to 20 pounds compared to 60 or 70 pounds. Uh, and those fish are, actually have much lower mercury. We continue to test uh, every year our mercury content. Our average mercury content has, has ranged between uh, 0 0.16 ppm to 0 0.22. It fluctuates in there. And, and that's very low. It's, it's lower, lower than many things that people eat without any consideration for mercury, like halibut or certain kinds of cod. John. John H. is asking, do you think Wild Planet's approach is scalable? Do you want to see a bumblebee-sized source of sustainable tuna? Excellent question. Um, th the approach is, is scalable indeed because our position at the current time is that pull and line tuna is the best choice. But if, if there were um, a switch to to fad free skipjack fishing. That was just the old fashioned, you hunt a whole school of the right size fish and you'd capture that without the bycatch. That is entirely, uh, that is entirely scalable and, and would produce massive quantities of additional fish beyond what's currently being produced because the yield of each fish would be larger because it would be caught at a, at, a, at a higher age. So do I want to see a bumblebee-sized source of sustainable tuna? Absolutely. I'd, I'd like to see uh, all tuna in the, in the world being caught with, with, this, with this whole line or a completely fad-free method. But fad-free really needs to mean that the vessel is fad-free. It doesn't just catch a small part of stuff that it catches fat without a fad sells that for a marketing premium and then goes and fishes with, uh, with, with its fads and sells the balance of their catch to someone else. I want to go to uh, John at, uh, at Greenpeace. John says, congratulations for scoring number one in the Greenpeace's canned tuna ranking. What message do you have for the companies near the bottom of the list? Well, the companies at the bottom of the list need to invest in, in, in tuna that's caught more sustainably. Now, there is a cost. There's a, there's a short-term cost at, at in making the, your suppliers comply with better harvest practices. Of course, that's, 
that, that that's going to cost. Um, we've been living in a world of commodity tuna where shortcuts are the answer to profitability. But I believe that consumers are willing to pay for a more responsible and a more, a more uh, environmentally sound uh, management of the oceans. And so uh, I would encourage them to just step up and do the right thing. They know as much about the sustainability issues as anybody because they're right in the, in the center of the issue. So going, you know, without any further questions on the, the sidebar here, I'll go back to that one on slave labor. Wild Planet buys tuna from local fleets that fish off their local shores and brings the product back to their local uh, communities. And that's the case in, in the United States. It's the case in Japan. It's the case in New Zealand. Those are places where we buy uh, uh, our tuna. Those are independently uh, uh, responsible local fish boat owners that hire local people to go out on their fish on their boats and and they're subject to local wages. And so that the, the slave labor isn't isn't a problem uh, for us at all. We certainly hope that 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 issue gets straightened out. One of the things that that we're asked a lot as in the last few years is is there a concern about radiation in the seafood in the pacific uh in the north pacific whether the pacific northwest or or whether on the the other side of the ocean near japan and wild planet took that very seriously right from the the event that that occurred there with the tsunami and the and the radiation uh leak out of fukushima we began testing all of our seafood in April of 2011, and we continue to test to this day every lot of seafood that we buy from anywhere, United States or Japan. We, we test that seafood, and in the last two years, we have not had a detectable amount of radiation at all. I know there's a, there's a lot of news out there about, um, about this, this bloom of, of radioactive water coming to the West Coast, but... The, the ocean currents are are very are very much like a washing machine and and that that water is completely dissolving within the pacific and it and traces of, of radiation cannot now be found by us down to very low detection levels and so we don't believe there's really a concern there at all there's a question from cassidy who asks this how many times a week is it okay for kids to eat canned tuna and salmon. Well, I guess it really depends on the size of your kid, because it's it's a matter of, of how much mercury exposure uh, does the EPA recommend as a limit per kilo or pound of body weight. So the smaller the person, then the less uh, the less amount of, of mercury uh, mercury high fish they should eat now mercury they shouldn't be eating any sort of fish or shark according to the EPA recommendations and wild planet makes it a point that we don't want to to be uh, advocates of a particular consumption recommendation that's the purview of of, of boards uh, like state advisory boards governmental national advisory boards. What they say is uh, for women who are expectant or, or may be uh, expecting, a woman uh, should eat no more than one can of albacore and could eat a couple cans of skipjack. Uh, children, it's about the same recommendation, except for very small children, which you'd want to serve a little less to, but the kids don't eat that much anyway. And then finally, um, and then finally, uh, ad other adults who are not of childbearing years and don't expect to become pregnant, they could, they could eat a lot more. I, I see that we're running out of time here. I'm going to conclude by thanking everyone for coming on board. And I really, really apologize that, that we were, had such a difficulty getting the Google Hangout started. Uh, we appreciate individuals for uh, tuning in and wanting to listen. If you'd like more information uh, on any of these subjects, we have about 20, 
three videos on our website. And those videos uh, go into other details uh, that, are, that are related to these things that we've spoken about today. So I want to thank everyone for, for, for tuning in. And I promise that if we do another uh, of these Google uh, Hangouts, that, that I will be completely ready and I'll understand exactly what a Google Hangout is a lot better than I did today. So I apologize that it was a little, uh, a little rough for the first time through. We appreciate your interest in sustainability. We appreciate uh, many of you are, are essentially advocates and evangelists for sustainability. And we hope that those efforts will really uh, drive meaningful change in, in consumer perception and, in, and ultimately the demand and the way oceans are harvested for a long, long time to come. Thank you so much for tuning in.